In the beginning, part 12, the heavens are telling a biblically informed cosmology. We've been going through the book in the beginning, full title, Science and Scripture Confirm Creation. It's um, edited by Brian Ball. And uh, Brian Ball was born in Devon, England, and then got his MA from uh, Andrews University, his PhD from the University of London, and then became a church pastor, evangelist, conference president, principal of Avondale College, and now president of the South Pacific Division. He is married to Don, and they have three children. Um, the book itself is written from the perspective that views scripture as decisive. As the uh, introduction says, its authority takes precedence over all other sources of information concerning origins. And not surprisingly with that, uh, the book has mostly been about theology. And we've been through uh, some uh, 10 chapters on that. Various um, uh, discussions, evidence for the faithful transmission of the text, arguments against higher criticism, and for view consonant with Jesus in the New Testament. This uh, includes scientific chapters by Tim Standish, Grenville Kent, whom we'll talk about today, John Walton, James Gibson, and Ariel Roth. Um, I, it also deals with theistic evolution and with evolutionary morality, actually in reverse order. Um, Grenville J.R. Kent, uh, if you're not familiar with him, I wasn't when I got started. He got a BA from Macquarie University in mass communication. He got another BA, I think, in theology, as near as I can tell, but this is uh, in his official website, so it's a little easier to be sure of. Um, his MA um, at the University of Technology in Sydney, Australia, in film. He got a, a Doctor of Ministry at Moreland College in Apologetics. He got an honorary uh, master's at the same college. He got a PhD in the, uh, from the University of Manchester in Old Testament, uh, looking at, interestingly enough, the Song of Solomon. He is currently teaching at Wesley Institute in Australia. And he's married to Carla, and he has six children. And this time, I am sure of who he's married to. I apologize. The last time I got it off of a garbled uh, reference um, uh, and didn't check it out well enough, and, and uh, I didn't know enough to know that I was wrong last week. So the uh, <coughs> Grenville Kent <laughs> starts out his... Um, his uh, 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 article with three, uh, with two quotations. One by Professor Stephen Hawking, the human race is just a chemical scum on a moderate sized planet orbiting around a very average star in the outer suburb of one among a hundred billion galaxies. We are so in insignificant that I can't believe the whole universe exists for our benefit. And then somebody who saw the same insignificance uh, from the same data and uh, drew a different conclusion, uh, namely David in Psalm 8, 3 and 4, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, what is man that you are mindful of him? And then Grenville Kent starts a story. One starry night, I was singing to my wife, Carla, a romantic old love song. Fly me to the moon, let me play among the stars, let me see what spring is like on Jupiter and Mars. Then I actually thought about the words. Is he trying to kill her, I said? The moon has minimal gravity and no atmosphere. A star is a sustained thermonuclear explosion that emits unthinkable heat and more deadly radiation per second than a trillion Hiroshima's. And Jupiter is made of gas and its gravity is 2.3 times that of Earth. So she would weigh 2.3 times as much. How depressing. And she would freeze because its temperature is about minus 150 degrees self Celsius. Mars is freezing too. Carla laughed and kissed me goodnight. 
But the unromantic truth is that space is not friendly to human life. There is no spring on Jupiter and Mars. So why is Earth just right for human life? For a planet to support life, and astrobiologists are currently searching the cosmos for biofriendly planets, there are many factors that have to exist within very precise parameters. These include the following. Distance from the star. The planet needs to be the right distance from the parent star. Venus is too close to our sun and has a huge greenhouse effect at 460 degrees Celsius. Unmanned missions there last only a few hours. So Venus couldn't support life. Mars is too far away and freezing cold. We live on Earth, which is between them in the habitable zone of our solar system with abundant liquid water, which is essential to life as we know it. This is also known as the Goldilocks zone because it is just right, like Mother Bear's porridge. Although I think that's a mistake. I think it's actually Baby Bear's porridge. Um, because Mother Bears is too cold and Father Bears is too hot, if I remember the story correctly. A 2% change in our orbit, either nearer to the sun or further away, would wipe out all life on Earth. The right kind of star. The planet also needs the right kind of parent star. Red giants and white dwarfs are highly unlikely to support life. Red dwarfs have only a small habitable zone but main sequence stars, like our sun, are ideal. Yet, if the sun had 20% more or less mass, Earth would be hotter than Venus or colder than Mars and hostile to life. Orbit shape. Some planets orbit distal stars with elliptical orbits so long that their oceans, if they had any, would boil when in proximity to the sun and freeze at outer extremes. Earth's orbit is an almost a perfect circle, known to be ideal for the existence and continuity of life. Spin rate. Mercury is the closest planet to the sun, and its sunny side can reach 465 degrees Celsius. Yet Mercury spins very slowly. Its day equals 59 Earth days, and so its dark side is minus 185 degrees Celsius. Fortunately, Earth rotates about every 24 hours, keeping temperatures fairly con consistent and giving most of us dark nights for sleeping. Rotation angle. Earth's spin axis is tilted at an angle of 23.5 degrees, which gives us the seasons of the year. When the northern hemisphere is leaning away from the sun, it's winter there. A higher angle would mean severe seasons, but fortunately the mass of our moon is large enough to keep the Earth's tilt stabilized. It's interesting to me that uh, the gentleman from down under picks the northern hemisphere as the, as the one to, to give the example. Uh, the moon's gravitational pull also attracts our oceans and causes tides that stir and cleanse, but is not big enough to pull us out of orbit. Magnetic field. We need protection from all the dangerous radiation in space, like the solar wind, which is a stream of electrically charged particles. Fortunately, Earth has a magnetic field, thanks to a concentration of molten iron at its core and its moderate rotation rate. But if Earth's magnetic field were much stronger, we would probably experience very severe electromagnetic storms. Again, just right. There is life on Earth because the combination of all the necessary conditions make it possible. Gonzales and Richards, and interestingly enough, I haven't put in all the notes, if you want them to get the book and look at it, um, but they don't have a note for Gonzales and Richard, which of course uh, those two authors wrote The Privileged Planet. Rightly called our Earth The Privileged Planet, since it exists and supports life thanks to a unique set of circumstances. As yet, we know of none like it in the entire cosmos. <coughs> And then he discusses astronomical. Uh, there's the theory of gravity itself, which operates across astronomical distances. It will help if we can try to visualize the vastness of space. Our solar system is about 9,000 million kilometers across, measured from Neptune's orbit. 
And again, this is the Reader's Digest version, so I will skip a few things in the book. To grasp that, imagine the fastest space vehicle developed so far, the unmanned Helios solar probe, which travels at 253,000 kilometers per hour, about 260 times faster than a passenger jet. At this staggering speed, it would still take over four years to cross our solar system. <coughs> Measured in this way, and I think there's a little editing here that went on, our solar system is only about 0 0.0009 light years in diameter, while the Milky Way galaxy is 100,000 light years across. The Milky Way contains 200 billion or perhaps as many as 400 billion stars like our sun. Yet our sun, which is only an average sized star, could contain about a million planets the size of Earth. A star in Orion named Betelgeuse could fit in over a million suns the size of ours. And there are even bigger stars than that. It used to be thought that our galaxy was about all there was. But estimates from the Hubble Space Telescope now suggest 100 billion galaxies, each with 100 to 200 billion stars, many of them probably with planets revolving around them. The nearest galaxy to our own Milky Way is called Andromeda, some 2.54 billion light years away. This distance sounds awesome, but the observable universe is now calculated at 28 billion light years across. And that's only what astronomers can observe at the present time. It appears that things have been finely tuned to allow for human life. Earth seems to have the best location, not just in our solar system, but also in our galaxy. It is not too near the center of the galaxy where X-rays and gamma radiation from the black hole would, could incinerate us, and where thick traffic would make fatal collisions and gravity disturbances more likely not to mention danger from exploding supernova. Earth is located on the inner edge of one of the galaxy's spiral arms, which may protect us from radiation. It is also sufficiently removed from the cosmic dust and debris contained within the arms themselves. From this vantage point, we are able to observe the rest of the cosmos, or much of it, a fact in itself of great significance. And I wish he had developed this more because it's one thing to argue that life ha uh, Earth has to be just the way it is in order for life to exist, but Earth doesn't have to be the way it is in order for our ability to observe the cosmos and to start to understand how it's made. Mm. There's no evolutionary advantage in us being able to understand the cosmos and why the human brain would be selected for it or why the earth would be selected for it is entirely beyond uh, explanation in the traditional sense. Although, of course, with intelligent design, it would make perfect sense. This is uh, a relative to the argument from beauty. Gravity. Gravity is one of the four most basic forces of nature, along with the electromagnetic force and the strong and weak nuclear forces. And the gravitational constant G, or big G, which helps calculate the attraction between objects with mass, as described by Newton's laws of universal gravitation and Einstein's theory of relativity, is again, just right. If its strength were smaller, everything would just fly apart. If it were bigger, Atoms would jam together, the orbits of stars would contract, stars would squeeze in on themselves and burn faster, and our sun would be 1,000 times brighter. In short, we would not exist if Big G had a different value. Beyond this, the relationship between gravity and the three other forces is delicately fine-tuned. To take just one example, if the ratio of the nuclear strong force to the electromagnetic force were different by only one in 100,000 million million, 10 to the 17th. No stars would form. So gravity is stunningly fine-tuned in itself along with other forces that have just the right settings and values to allow life to exist on Earth. There are about 30 coincidences or examples of apparent fine-tuning 
now known, that's my misprint, according to Paul Davies in the Goldilocks Enigma, why is the universe just right for life? And as you can see, uh, Granville Kent didn't invent that uh, idea. Um, he counts 20 from physics and 10 from cosmology. Why this fine tuning? Space is mainly a dead zone with no air, fatal radiation, and gigantic players that could crush Earth and extinguish all life on it within seconds. And yet, there is a tiny corner of the universe that allows <coughs> us to live, to think, to look out at the uh, cosmos before us and to wonder. And I think that, again, is my misprint. Why should this huge galactic theater have a role for human beings? Why should its settings allow us to live and give us the privileged role of observers? This is often called the cosmic anthropic principle. Those who have thought about it offer several various explanations. One, don't ask. This question has often been treated with casual <coughs> concern or been considered off limits. The atheist philosopher Bertrand Russell famously once observed, I should say that the universe is just there, and that's all. Which uh, is basically conceding the point to your opponent, I would think. Physicist Edward Tryon feels our universe is simply one of those things which happen from time to time. Others say that obviously we're in a universe that supports life or else we wouldn't be having this discussion. So there's really nothing surprising in it. Um, and we're going to discuss that part later, but of course the idea of the universe being set up for exploration and understanding uh, and the idea of beauty those, those things don't necessarily fit into that explanation. But philosopher John Leslie asks us to imagine that after a huge firing squad shoots right at us, we find that we have survived. Would we then say, of course I survived or I wouldn't be here, so there's nothing surprising about that? Or would our first question be, how did that happen? Chance. Many scientists say we are here by chance. Yet many acknowledge that the chances of intelligent life existing anywhere in the universe are astronomically low, almost impossibly low, since all these settings have to be right at the same time. Astronomer Hugh Ross identified 140 settings that must be just right for life to exist in the universe and 922 factors necessary for one life-supporting planet to appear anywhere in the universe and calculated the probability of each of them occurring at a, the same time. He found that it was lower than one in 10 to the 311th power. That number is staggeringly formidable. It equals the number of atoms in the known universe times the number of atoms in the known universe times the number of atoms in the known universe. Unfortunately, the original text says times the number of atoms in the known universe, where if you calculate it, it's only three times. Uh, times 100 million, billion, 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 billion. And this almost unthinkable number describes the odds of getting just one planet ready for human existence. In a universe without God, it would be necessary to take these odds and multiply them by the odds of the first living cell forming by chance, then by the chances of step-by-step -step evolution, an enormous number in itself. In other words, you have the universe first ready for life, then you have the probability of life arising, then you have the probability of life advancing to us or at least to something like us. Unlikely things do happen, but all this is so far beyond the probability bound that it is, in reality, borderline impossible. Many scientists claim that the universe mysteriously just happened to permit life and that we humans are an irrelevant accident in a vast, meaningless cosmos. This is easy and fashionable to say, but it would, act, would it actually encourage science to keep looking for order and understanding the law of the laws that govern life and to assume that the universe is a rational place? Or does the claim border on the surreal? 
string theory. This view suggests that from the beginning the universe was governed by the laws of science and doesn't need to be set in motion by some god. Stephen Hawking believes there is a deep underlying unity to physics, a mathematical theory that can explain it all. If only we could determine what it was. It may be string theory or M theory, um, membrane theory, and some very intelligent people are trying to discover it, Hawking among them. I hope they do. And then my question will be, why does this most elegant formula exist? Did it arise randomly by sheer chance, with no thought behind it? Or does an elegant law suggest a brilliant lawmaker? Why is the human mind capable of understanding it? Why do I have a mind in the first place? Professor Hawking's famous comment about chemical scum is witty, but I do not believe that he is chemical scum. And then he discusses Hawking's heroic battle against um, uh, ALS. Nor do I think that you and I are chemical scum either. The evidence suggests a more encouraging conclusion, and he talks about that. Multiple universes. This theory holds that there are many other parallel universes that we are unable to perceive, each one with different physical constants, but that ours is the one that allows human life. Yet, if these universes are, by definition, unobservable, then can they be the legitimate subject of scientific inquiry, or does this belong more in the realm of science fiction? Is it physics or metaphysics? A multiverse seems extremely complicated and fanciful when one creator is a much simpler and more elegant explanation for, of the evidence. Simulation. We may be just characters in a giant cosmic game, perhaps titled Earth 1.0 or for all we know Earth 100,000.2, operated by God or some super advanced civilization. Some serious thinkers are also playing with this idea. And of course, if God created us, then uh, that would fit into that kind of a, a theory. Perhaps the universe is digital, and there are people who have s suggested that. A designer. Many scientists have concluded that the precision and beauty we see in the universe is best explained by a designing mind. Professor Head, uh, Fred Hoyle was an atheist. But in studying how stars for form the carbon on which our life is based, that's my typo again. He noticed that the energy levels in the molecule had to be at a very precise setting that statistically was extremely unlikely. He wrote, would you not say to yourself some super calculating intellect must have designed the properties of the carbon atom, otherwise the chance of my finding such an atom through the blind forces of nature would be utterly minuscule. A common sense interpretation of the facts, those are his ellipses, by the way, suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with the physics as well as with the chemistry and biology, and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seems to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. Hoyle was so shaken by this discovery that he began to think that there was a guiding force in the universe. There's a long list of great thinkers who have seen design in the elegance and function of the universe and the human friendliness of our little corner of it and the fact that we have minds that can make sense of it. And he mentions Arno Penzias and Isaac Newton. Belief in God has not stopped such thinkers from asking questions about how these things have happened. In fact, it has made them expect precise laws and complex processes instead of mindless chaos. Yet there is a more basic question, why is there anything at all? And he discusses the Islamic Kalam uh, theologians and uh, the Kalam argument. It seems increasingly clear that the universe must have been caused by something outside itself. Beyond its complexity and precision, its sheer beauty also suggests an artist, a superintelligence. Such a being would be the most fascinating, intriguing, awe-inspiring identity in the universe ever to have existed. And if God is interested in human life, as the evidence suggests, there wouldn't 
then wouldn't that mean that humans are not chemical scum, but love children alive with a purpose? The Bible repeatedly emphasized, emphasizes that human existence is intentional. It says, the highest heavens belong to Yahweh, but he has given the earth to the children of Adam. Further, it describes God's intentions uh, for earth. He created it to be inhabited. We are here by divine purpose. With all this in mind, we now turn to the Bible to explore one of its major cosmological statements expressed in poetry. C.S. Lewis called it one of the greatest lyrics in the world. Here is my translation. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the sky announces his handiwork. Day to day pouring out speech, night to night revealing knowledge. There is no speech, there are no words, their voice is not audible. Yet their message goes throughout the world, their words to earth's farthest reaches. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun which is like a bridegroom coming out of his room and like a champion who loves running his course. At one end of the heaven he bursts out and his circuit reaches to the other end. Nothing can be hidden from the heat. The Torah revelation of Yahweh is perfect, restoring your life. The testimony of Yahweh is sure, making a simple person wise. The teachings of Yahweh are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commandments of Yahweh is pure, bringing light to the eyes. The fear of, the Yahweh, of Yahweh is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of Yahweh are truth and altogether righteous. And notice it's six times, which of course would be incomplete. They are more desirable than gold dust, more, worth more than a pile of ingots. They are sweeter than honey, dripping from the honeycomb. Even more they illuminate your servant. Keeping them is its own reward. Who can know their own unconscious errors? Cleanse me from hidden faults and hold me back from deliberate sins. I'm your servant. Don't let them rule over me. Then I will be sound and innocent of the, of the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the musings of my inmost self be pleasing to you, O Yahweh, the seventh time, my rock my Redeemer. This remarkable poem falls into three parts or movements. Number one, admiration of the heavens, especially the sun, as showing God's glory. Number two, admiration of the Torah or written word of God as improving human life. And number three, asking for redemption from personal sinfulness. We should notice the names for God in each part and how they are used. L, the generic term for God, used once, in incidentally, the first part. Yahweh, Israel's special covenant name for God, used six times in the second pa uh, passage. To Hebrew ear, six uses would have sounded incomplete, like an unresolved chord, because seven is the number of God in perfection. Yahweh used a satisfyingly seventh time as part of a threefold name together with my rock and my redeemer. Intensely personal titles. The song's last note carries the word redeemer, Hebrew goel. This meant a relative who came to the aid of someone who had fallen into debt so badly they were about to be sold into slavery and who spent his own money to buy back or redeem that unfortunate person. This practice was known in the Torah, but was often used as a picture of God redeeming people from literal slavery or from slavery to sin. This is clear imagery of the gospel in which Christ paid our huge moral debt accrued by sin. Paul recognized this. You know the grace of our master Jesus, the Messiah, who though he was rich, made himself poor for our sakes, that through his poverty we might become rich. These three parts of the poem are distinct, yet they work together as literature and as theology. They are linked by the theme of speaking. The heavenly bodies speak silently and their wordless words go without translation to people of every language. 
Yahweh speaks in the Torah. His character can be discerned in this kind of advice. And the poet speaks to God, asking that his words and even his silent inner dialogues will be pleasing. This would make him like the stars, which with silence and speech bring glory to God. Running through these three parts, there's also a theme of illumination of hidden things, the sun illuminating and so forth. Psalm 19 begins with a wide angle lens focused on the universe. It then zooms in to human life and God's advice for it and then concludes with a breathtaking close up of one human heart and its redemption through a private relationship with God. Links to Genesis. Psalm 19 draws imagery from Genesis, depicting heaven and earth, firmament, the El Rakia that we've been looking at a few times, and sun, day and night, God and human beings. David Kleins argues that it uses Garden of Eden imagery by comparing the Torah to the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The Torah revives life more than food can. The forbidden fruits seem desirable, nechemad, uh, to make a person wise. But Torah is really desirable, same word, and makes the simple wise. The snake promised that the fruit would open Adam's and Eve's eyes. But with sad irony, their eyes only opened to the fact that they were naked and exposed. Yet the Torah really enlightens the eyes. To eat of the forbidden fruit means certain death, but the Torah brings life and endures forever. So Psalm 19 subtly claims that the tasty, eye-opening, life-giving fruit humans really want is Torah, God's life-giving word. Further, the three movements of Psalm 19 parallel the three major movements of Genesis 1 through 3. Genesis 1 talks about the creator of the heavens, and of course the first part of Psalm 19 does as well. Genesis 2. Um, talks about an imminent God, uh, as he puts it there, two different accounts, but uh, they're really, uh, <laughs> given his film experience, they're, they're uh, two different camera angles. And Genesis 3 talks about the fall, and yet God promises redemption. And the last part of the psalm does the same. Finally and significantly, the poet prays that he will be innocent of the great transgression. Scholars have understood the great transgression to mean many things, but Kleins argues for a Genesis connection, proposing that Psalm 19, 12 through 15, especially verse 13, may be alluding to the fall narrative so that it would mean the fall of the human race, the great transgression. The poet then prays, don't let these sins rule me, using a word from God's command that Cain must rule over sin in Genesis 4, 7. So Psalm 19 seems to correspond to the movements of the Genesis creation narrative. El, or Elohim in the Genesis uh, story, creates heaven and earth. Yahweh communicates with humans, and then Yahweh comes close as a personal rock and redeemer. Psalm 19 links the natural world and religion. This seems like a bold move today, with some well-publicized scientists saying that God is a delusion and religion is like smallpox, but harder to eradicate. Some religious people have acted as if science were threatening to faith, ignoring its logic and the technological blessings it provides. This psalm shows both nature and scriptures as revealing God, although in different ways. Scholars have long spoken of the book of nature that reveals God, as does the Bible. And he talks about Francis Bacon and Galileo. Paul, who quotes Psalm 19, argues that since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divinity, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. The revelation in nature needs the special revelation of scripture. It's not complete in itself for several reasons. First, nature gives a silent, indirect, and mysterious witness. The wordless stars contrast with the manifest verbal message of Torah. 
Second nature does not reveal that God created it, so that some worship the stars rather than their maker. Nature is not brand named with a cross. Third, the reason that nature does not perfectly reveal God is the fall and the curse described in Genesis. So Torah must interpret nature for us and explain why it is as it is. This is a key insight for the contemporary age. Since Darwin, the pressure has been on Christian theology to accommodate, to revise itself to fit with Darwin, Darwinism, to allow nature, or more precisely, one interpretive lens placed upon nature, to reinterpret scripture, even if scripture must be twisted and forced into an unnatural pattern. Not to do so seems in our culture to be blind to nature and deaf to scientific orthodoxy. Dawkins says it, I believe it, and that settles it. <coughs> Yet anyone who reads the Bible and is courageous enough to look for its most natural reading has another authority, one that is not fallen. There is no question that God speaks in nature, but would it be sensible to allow fallen nature to rewrite the Bible, or is it more not logical to let the Bible be the foundation for our understanding of nature? Creative Challenge at the time Psalm 19 was written, many people believed in the sun god and many other deities in nature. The sun god Shamash was often associated with justice and truth and enlightenment. Enlightenment is particularly easy to understand. So this poem playfully pers personifies the sun, Hebrew Shamash, as a bouncy bridegroom or athlete, but makes it very clear that God has pitched his tent, or dropping the metaphor, determined its place. This Hebrew monotheism was actually a step towards authentic science. If one believes that there are many gods who control various aspects of the, human, of the natural world and that their interactions with humans depends on whether one prays enough or gives enough, then one wouldn't bother to look for consistent laws of nature. But the Bible saw one God and expected one set of laws to govern all nature. Psalm 19 creatively challenged the dominant worldview of its time, and it does so today. Most scientists today believe in one less God than monotheism, while also offering horoscopes based on recycled ancient superstitions, much of the mainstream media suggests that science has eliminated the need for any God at all, oversimplifying complex issues and presenting only one side of an unbalanced ongoing discussion. Some scientists see creationists as a flat earth society composed of anti-intellectual faith heads. Yet, as another chapter in this book reveals, a number of elite scientists, some believers, some not, are pointing to the widening cracks in the dominant paradigm. Some are seriously wondering whether the complex masterpiece of DNA spelling could have arisen by chance beginning to question the standard models of the origin of life and the mechanisms of biological evolution. Some are not mere reflectors of these mainstream ideas, but reformers who read the plain meaning of scripture without being as simplistic or atavistic, and use it as a catalyst for original thought, which seeks to understand God's revelation in nature and in the written word. And hopefully we'll have a book out soon uh, illustrating that. You are here. After I spoke on nine, uh, Psalm 19 recently, a scientist said to me, for years I was stuck in the first section, enjoying science and sensing that there had to be a mind behind it, but not really knowing who or what that mind was or anything about its name and character. Then I started checking out church and gradually moved into section two, admiring the Bible and its moral code. Now I'm started into section three, speaking to God, asking for grace for my personal sins, beginning to know that he is my redeemer from sin, my rock, in whatever life throws at me. I found his intuitive reading of this great psalm made me check my own personal connection with God. Psalm 19 invites us to imagine a creator big enough to fling out the universe with anthropomorphic fingertips and challenges us to reflect on this incredible book of nature, prizing science and logic. It reveals a communicative God wise enough to guide our lives with his timeless word and elegant laws, calling us to study Torah with a humility and awe 
at God's own character and grandeur. And its final word rings with hope of an immeasurably rich relative who is gracious enough to come close and buy us out of slavery, the life giver paying with his own life to make the universe very good once more and to include all of us in it. It also challenges us to tell people of every language about God's greatness, as the stars do, and of his grace to all the fallen children of Adam and Eve. They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the heavens, and they that turn people to righteousness shall shine as the stars forever. Daniel 12, 3. Now, my own take on this, uh, Grenville Kent has an interesting take on cosmology, and particularly his uh, looking at uh, Psalm 19. Uh, in the grand theory of the book, the um, book defends the scriptural th story of Genesis. There are 10 chapters of, on theology and uh, related issues. Um, then there is the chapter that we studied last week on intelligent design, the chapter this week on cosmology, which is where it fits. The limits of evolution will be um, um, the next time we uh, take up the book again. Critiques of evolutionary theory and um, the flood, which is R.L. Roth's chapter. And then they will discuss evolutionary ethics and uh, attempted compromise between uh, evolution and creation, theistic evolution. And that's the uh, plan. Uh, Dr. Kent does a good job of recognizing the implications of modern cosmology, I think. Um, I'm particularly encouraged by the fact that he appears to have more training in theology and filmmaking than in cosmology, and yet seems to have gotten the main outlines of the argument from cosmology correct. I like his exegesis of Psalm 19. And um, I, I think it's fair to say that the fact of the matter is that the biblical record and cosmology are on our side. And with that, I will open the floor to your comments and questions. We have a comment over here. Ariel? Well, if nobody else is going to say anything, I'll start out something. Uh, <laughs> I find the, uh, the argument he mentions about uh, uh, many universes and so on, the multiverse thing, and the uh, uh, interesting, and I think uh, quite perceptive. I, I like his argument on it. Uh, <clears throat> I would mention that uh, it, it is a singularly destructive argument for science. Uh, yeah, I, I think that was mentioned actually last week. <clears throat> it, yeah, it's, it's almost uh, unbelievable that this would be such a popular, you know, Hawkins of course believes in it and uh, uh, others uh, uh, follow this uh, this same particular line, but uh, what is uh, so destructive about it is that you can prove anything you want to by this argument. You just say, I just happened to be in the universe where this happened. There are all kinds of other arguments. There's no evidence for any of these other ar uh, universes uh, and so on, uh, so that uh, it tells you to a certain extent how uh, illogical we can proceed with confidence uh, along the lines that are totally invalidate science. Uh, there's no way to prove this wrong. There's no way to test it scientifically. I mean, it, it's, uh, it is a good example of uh, how we tend to get our minds into certain channels, that, and we need to avoid this. Uh, scientists aren't the only ones that do this. 
Well, it's worse than that. It actually proves too much. Uh, for example, <coughs> what keeps our feet from going through the floor is that there are atoms in the, uh, um, in the floor that on balance are hitting our feet harder than our feet are pushing down. Otherwise, we would, uh, uh, or they're hit actually hitting it just exactly as hard as our feet are pushing down. Otherwise, we would sink through the floor. Um, in the case of water, if we try to stand on water, uh, the atoms push in a slightly less strong uh, for with a st slightly less strong force on our feet than our feet do on the uh, atoms, and so we sink into water. Uh, in principle, other than the second law of thermodynamics, there's no particular reason why one could not simply walk on water and have all the atoms of the water support one's feet. And so if, uh, if somehow we got rid of the second law of thermodynamics, if somehow we got rid of the idea that entropy always goes in one direction, um, then uh, there's no particular reason why we should deny that uh, somebody could walk on water. And you know what? If there are reliable witnesses that say that that person walked on water, who are we to question? Once you go that route, you have no reason to deny miracles of any kind. And the entire scientific critique of miracles falls apart. And really that makes a certain amount of sense because after all, what they're trying to do is they're trying to explain a miracle that is, for example, the appearance of life without an intelligence making that happen. In which case, why can't miracles happen without intelligence? And perhaps you can't see them coming but in hindsight, you could see them. And so if there are reliable witnesses that tell us that something happened that was a miracle, it happened that way. Um, I'm not sure they want to go down that road. And in fact, I think that, the, the, of course, the immediate thing was, be, well, those aren't really reliable witnesses. Well, yeah, I know. They gave their life for their witness. So I suppose they're probably as reliable as anything else we've got. But that's not the way science works. Well, science doesn't work with uh, the origin of life either. So, you know, the problem is that when you try to destroy the power of the, uh, the idea that miracles don't happen without intelligence, and then uh, the same tool that you use can be used to destroy the idea that uh, other miracles didn't happen. Need to be cautious here, of course. Uh, you can attribute, attribute everything to miracles. And uh, after you do that, you've lost rationality. Uh, and uh, but reality seems to be neither one way or the other. Rationality seems to work. Universe makes sense. Cause and effect seems to be dominant. Uh, on the other hand, our calculations of probability and so on all tell us, hey, uh, life can arise by itself. There's got to be and at least on the basis of our understanding, there's, there's got to be uh, some exceptions to just purely naturalistic, mechanistic interpretations, uh, in which we, which we call miracles. And so, uh, our, our, at least I, mean, I feel, uh, we should lean towards the idea that, uh, well, uh, yes, nature or reality, excuse me, don't want to use that in our nature at all. Reality is more complex than nature suggests. 
uh, or a study of nature suggests, and we'd be wise to open that door, uh, but we also have to face the fact that nature tells us no uh, uh, miracles don't always happen. Yeah, most of the time they don't. Coming back there. I hear people say at times that the, the Big Bang Theory is, is in trouble. Can you tell us more about that? Can anybody tell us here more about that? Uh, I'm not an authority on uh, exactly uh, uh, Can non-authorities speak up here, Paul? Pardon me? Can those who are not authorities speak up here? <laughs> they may. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll say one thing and then I'll let you uh, take it from there. Uh, and that is that in one sense the Big Bang is in trouble because there are problems with the theory. And there's, there are some vari variables that have been kind of uh, made to work ad hoc. And so its predictions are not as good as you would like. In another sense, the Big Bang Theory is not in trouble at all. In that, if you insist that matter is eternal as far as we can push it, then as far as we can push it is somewhere around 13.7 billion years. And at that point, it all projects into a point. And so, one can argue for only one miracle, but one is stuck with the original, uh, what the physicists would call singularity. Um, there are some good reasons to argue that, for example, the distribution of galaxies may better fit with a plasma universe, for example. But what I'm saying is that it, uh, th while the Big Bang itself may not be the way things started, what you can say is you can't get further back than the Big Bang. That whatever it was is either at least that young or younger. We could spend hours, of course, debating the Big Bang and it's evidences and its opposers. Uh, I'd like to just take time to comment on Dr. Grenville Kent. I've known Grenville for decades and uh, he's an Australian. He has, you know, a significant advantage in life, but he's a part of uh, a lot, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> There's just a little humility coming in here. <laughs> <clears throat> but he's a part of the Kent tribe in Australia that is a very large Adventist tribe, actually. Uh, I knew the Kents very well when I was a teenager. Had a crush on a Miss Kent at one stage, which fortunately I escaped from. But um, J.W. Kent was one of Australia's greatest, most eloquent evangelists. If you asked him to say grace over your breakfast cereal, he could preach a magnificent sermon before saying amen. <laughs> Grenville Kent is one of that tribe. Uh, there's another Kent right now in the Ministerial Association. He's an associate editor of Ministry Magazine, and he is uh, administering the series of pastoral seminars. I don't know what they are. But anyway, the Kents crop up all over the place in Australia, the Australian church. And I first got acquainted with Grenville, we'll be talking about him all morning, at an annual conference of Australian Adventist um, University students. Anyone in tertiary education was welcome, and I was a guest speaker. This was 20 years ago. Grenville Kent at that stage was the, the uh, advisor and counselor for this gang of students 
assembling from all over Australia. And I ventured to speak uh, with an invited guest whose name was Andrew Snelling, and you know who Andrew Snelling is, one of the, the finest Christian geologists extant today, has recently published a two-volume work, which I think will stand for a long time as a reference work, written from a young earth creation standpoint. Anyway, Andrew Snelling and Bernard Branstad were at this <laughs> convention in Queensland, and uh, we got into trouble. At least Snelling got into trouble. I was called, dragged in because I was, I was with him. And it was Grenville Kent who hushed the whole audience of university students and calmed them down. And we were there talking and debating together till after midnight. So that was Grenville Kent, the man who's written this chapter. And uh, he has been a, a, a model, I would say, for, for open-minded young Adventist scholars in Australia for many years. So just that characterizes the man. He, he, he's worth listening to. I found, personally, uh, reading his chapter, I found his stuff a really a rehash over after Hugh Ross and Frank Tipler. If, uh, if you want to really understand or get to the sources, I don't think anyone has surpassed Hugh Ross as, as a scholar and as a uh, collator of the remarkable so-called coincidence which make life possible on planet Earth. Uh, but he's another story. But the original author of the famous book, The Cosmic Anthropic Principle, is Frank Tipler and John Barrow. And uh, I've heard Tipler lecture, and I've also been to uh, Hugh Ross's meetings in Pasadena. And uh, they're very strong. And their evidence is, as, as you have reminded us this morning. Uh, you've used those imponderable numbers to uh, speak of, of life being impossible except for this one chance in all those billions of billions of billions. That is way past the level of impossibility, Paul. Let us not be afraid of the word. It's either church it's either, I'm sorry, it's either chance, which is random, an accident, or it's purpose and design. There is no intermediate position, as far as I can see. So, when you start quoting those numbers of probability, I just think that it... Yes. Um, on this, this question of why, because the whole argument about cosmology is why is the universe the way it is, essentially. And um, there's the, argu the probabilistic arguments presented against that being purely due to chance, um, which you'd have to go into those in detail, but seems exceedingly unlikely that the universe would be the way it is purely by chance. So then there was the first argument that was dealt with, um, which was, um, you know, Bertrand Russell and that sort of thing. It's just that way. And that seems very cheeky and kind of sarcastic and easy to dismiss. Um, and, and you said, um, seems like you're just seeding the argument. But, um, it seems like one way or another, um, you, you, you either have chance or you have explainable mechanisms or you just have the admission that um, it is that way. Because, and the, the, the reason that I would say that is with or with, without God in the, in the equation, if you talk about God and the universe, 
you can think of God and the universe as entirely separate or sort of morph together, which is, I think, what a lot of scientists like Einstein sort of do, and probably a lot of Eastern religions, or you can think of the universe sort of without God, like atheists would. But whichever of those you take, um, if you take the, the God as separate view, um, you're still left then with the answer of why, because you, you've said, well, it's because of God, but then you, you have the question, well, why God? And so um, you're left with this kind of philosophical question of why things are the way they are, and you still have this ultimate step of because, or it had to be that way, or it just is. Well, I, I would add to that uh, uh, that you can always ask this question, why? But it's a different question than, does God exist? Uh, and we need to keep uh, those, those two concepts separate uh, if you're going to uh, try and arrive at significant answers. Uh, it's true that there is a lot of things we don't know. But you can ask the question, why the universe? If you want to put God out of the picture, why the universe? Uh, uh, how did it come, if you put God out of the picture, how come, how come it exists? And so on. So uh, you can ask that question on several sides of this issue. Well, I think that the more important thing is that the asking of why of God has a more sensible answer than the asking why of the universe, for a very simple reason. And that is, uh, frankly, the limiting factor of the Big Bang. Now, the universe may not have been precisely created that way because of the Big Bang. But like I say, if you project matter back far enough, you come to a point. And in fact, Stephen Hawking was one of the two people that said, it isn't just that it comes very close and then spins out uh, so, that, so that you have an almost collapsing universe and then it, and then it expands again and it keeps doing this for, I don't know, however many times. But um, that in fact, if you project it back, it has to come to a point or as close to a point as quantum mechanics will let you get. And um, that being said, the universe cannot be eternal. God, on the other hand, could be eternal. And so, you can posit God as an un uncaused cause. You can't posit the universe as an uncaused cause because it had a beginning. That, that if, you're, if you're asking yourself, well, is it just that the universe is or is it just that God is? That it makes better philosophical sense to say that God is than it does to say that the universe just is. Because God could have existed from eternity. The universe could not. I have um, some problem with thinking that God is eternal in terms of the concept of time. Uh, and uh, so I... Uh, I see some equivalence here in, in uh, uh, some of our why questions there, uh, in that uh, I, I have to move into a, a variable time concept to think that God is eternal, because uh, I, I just can't conceive of uh, well, if that any more than I conceive the universe has always been here. Uh, I, I don't accept that. Uh, well, Einstein had a very uh, variable time concept, so you're in good company there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I take a little comfort there. I'm, I'm sometimes amazed at the, at the unbounded human confidence. 
to be able to answer questions. Um, Dawkins put this in another term. He says, that if you, if you, um, if God is an explanation, well, then what caused God? Well, sure, we can't answer that. If um, if God isn't, then then where did the universe come from? Where did the laws of nature come from? And any if you push back causation in time, he, finite humans come to a point where we have to say we have no answer. We don't have a clue. Can we can we just say that? <laughs> um, and in in terms of Big Bang, you know, I'm, I don't really know much about it, but I just thinking about how scientists work. They they have observations which you can make now. From these, they come up with the equations. How do they know what happens in fractions of a second after the beginning? It's just working, assuming that those equations carry back, assuming, it's a very big assumption, and working out those equations back farther and farther. That's all it is. Unbounded human confidence in something where we don't have a clue. Uh, well, one of the things that the Big Bang has forced upon us is the knowledge that in fact, although you can keep pushing those back, that when you get to that final point, all of the equations break down. You start doing things like dividing by zero, and you can't do that. So the mathematics falls apart. So I think that's one of the lessons that the Big Bang has taught us. And like I say, that's even if the Big Bang is not correct, even if there's some other theory that's a better explanation. One of the lessons the Big Bang has taught us is that we cannot know how the laws functioned for the entire lifetime of the universe. If I may just comment on the Big Bang. Please, if I've said this here before, years ago, forgive me. But my own experience looking at the Big Bang Theory is that it is under challenge, not from religious reasons at all, but from scientific reasons. Um, in 2004, uh, the uh, highly reputed magazine known as The New Scientist published a full-page advertisement signed by over 200 worldwide scientists, some of them Nobel Prize winners. And they signed this plea to the United States government to please assign some of its investment in research in theories other than the Big Bang, because over 200 scientists signing this thing were convinced that that theory was leading nowhere and was in fact an obstacle to the progress of American science. So there's a, a sizable worldwide community based on science, not upon any religious reason. Well, I've just to mention one thing, um, right after the Big Bang supposedly happened, there is supposed to have been a huge inflation where the universe expanded at speeds far faster than light. Now, you know, maybe Einstein is wrong and there are things that can go faster than light. I, uh, but the thing I find fascinating is that that was put in there because the universe is too smooth to otherwise account for it. What that means is that inflation, cosmic inflation is a major fudge factor. There's a lot of things that we don't understand. We like to say that we've got the theory down fact of the matter is we don't, and we don't even know for sure whether that theory is the one that's going to survive. Uh, and what I find fascinating is that the distribution of galaxies fits far better into a plasma universe than it does into the standard uh, Big Bang type theory. Um, suggesting that maybe we don't have things right. Again, the one thing I want to point out is that the Big Bang is the outer limit. If there's another story, it's even more recent. And that gives people who need lots and lots and lots of time fits because they don't have lots and lots and lots of time. 
Well, Paul, you're, you're simply uh, reminding us that the Big Bang Theory survives today because basically science without God doesn't have a satisfactory option. That's the trouble. There is no persuasive theory to take its place. And yet, scientists, not just the 200 I mentioned, but many others, uh, I've mentioned here perhaps before, the lecture that Timothy Eastman gave down in Claremont only about four years ago, I heard him lecturing for four hours. Uh, he is the chief of space physics for NASA. And there in these lectures, he trashed the Big Bang as a bankrupt theory that must be abandoned if American science is going to make progress. So there are some very serious heavyweight scientists who are challenging it, but as I said, unless you invoke an intelligent force out there, a god, it's very difficult for science to come up and rewrite all the books. And yet, that, that concept of the cosmic origin has a, I mean, it's, it's basic. Any Adventist scholar doing his doctoral studies in the university today is going to have, it, have those studies based upon Big Bang Theory and all the theories of nucleosynthesis and other things which necessarily follow you know, are, are lost without the Big Bang as a starting point. And I've encountered many of my good friends in the church who are very troubled that I should question the Big Bang. Anyway, thank you, Paul. <laughs> Pardon me. Certainly. Well, I, yeah, we have another comment here. It's hardly worth mentioning, but uh, Big Bang has survived for almost a century now. Uh, it's been called uh, the ultimate free lunch because there are so many coincidences that you have to account for. It's, it's not just God at the beginning. You, your, your expansion has to be exactly right. Your inflation has to be exactly right. These are coincidences that are hard to put up with. Uh, almost um, sounds planned. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, next week, um, the next week we'll discuss the ENCODE data, and uh, those of you who are particularly interested are welcome to come and invite others who, are, who, who like genetics. And, and uh, the finding that the human genome is not 97% um, junk, but it's more like a maximum of 20% junk and probably less than that. So I, I think you'll enjoy it. See you next week. <laughs>